Okay, я думаю, можна починати, раз ви скажете. Так, шановні колеги, я дуже е, радий вітати вас. Е, дуже приємно, що в ці непрості часи е, ми всі змогли зібратись і що у нас є такі чудові роботи, ми можемо можливість ознайомитися з ним вперед, тепер ще й слухаємо вашу презентацію. Але перше ж ми почнемо. Враховуючи знову не складні часів, от щодавно, нещодавно був дій в Кремлінчузі, я пропонував всім шанувати пам'ять за дитині колиною мовчання. Дякую, шановні колеги. Отже, нам залишається в ці непрості часи лише підвищувати вимогливість до себе, підвищувати вимогливість і лише піднімати планку рівня робіт. Я впевнений, що сьогодні з ними завдячними випускниками інстатури Сердаська. Це добрий путь з Богом. Дякую, пане Тарасе. Микола, давайте розпочинати. Отже, нагадаю регламент, ми маємо 20 хвилин на презентацію, 20 хвилин на дискусію. Тож, давайте. The floor is yours. Так, перш за все, дякую за те, що маю сьогодні можливість презентувати свою роботу, за те, що зібрався кворум, за те, що захист відбувається. Тож, дякую всім присутнім. Тут я переключусь на англійську і продовжу презентацію англійською. Там багато термінів і вирішив робити на цією мовою. So, my name is Mikola Klemenko, as you might suspect. And the topic of my, today I want to present you the project that was done under my master thesis. And its topic called Brain Age Prediction based on EG records. And its work was done by supervision of Dr. Vasily Vakorin from Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. And let me start from the end of the topic uh, from the EG record, rec records. What exactly is EG? So EG stands for electroencephalography and it's a neuroimaging tool, a neuroimaging tool for capturing uh, brain activity. Uh, it's non-invasive procedure as you may see on the picture. It's just a bunch of electrodes connected to the scalp with uh, this hat and they, this electrodes capturing um, electrical signal on the surface of the scalp. And uh, each, each electrode we refer as a channel, uh, the, let's, call it, let's call it channel uh, later. And the output of this uh, neuroimaging tool is actually, as you also can see on the picture, is a time series of a signal and um, a specific, uh, what makes specific uh, the signal that it's very long uh, so usually EEG recordings, they starting from 15, 20 minutes and may uh, take hours even in some specific cases. And um, how uh, physiologists and doctors work right now with the signals, they analyze it manually or visually. They just print it or explore it in the screen, explore, explore like all uh, those 20 minutes or even hours of signal trying to manually find some abnormalities based on their training or on their experience. And the downside of this approach, obviously, it's uh, a lot of mistakes that usually done by unexperienced uh, readers, by an experienced physiologist. They tend to overinterpret some uh, artifacts and uh, noise, which is also uh, a lot of noise and uh, artifacts are presented in the signal because any sudden move of the head or mimic muscles of the face uh, uh, represented in a spike of, uh, of the signal. And uh, 
um, as we might conclude, uh, this area, this domain, is uh, it has a huge potential for automation of this process and uh, uh, building uh, models and approaches that will ease uh, life of physiologists and assist them in the decision-making process. So what is current approaches to work and automatically analyze EEG records? So we can loosely divide them into three main categories. The first one is the calculated features. So uh, what is this? We just take a regional signal and trying to calculate some statistical measures that will describe the whole signal, like mean or standard deviation or amplitude. And these measures will describe the whole sequence. And based on these measures, we will uh, make some conclusions or uh, classification of EEG. The downside of this approach that it's not fully interpretable because those statistical measures, they can describe the whole sequence, but cannot point us to a specific place in the signal. The second approach is images. So we convert a uh, signal into uh, spectrograms or any other wavelets uh, form into pictures and analyze them using convolutional neural networks, like deep learning, uh, especially convolutional neural networks. The downside of this approach, again, is a lack of interpretability. It's like common uh, problem with all deep learning models. And another downside is that we need to specify a lot of parameters in advance, like length of the frame and the length of the time series that we can analyze, because all pictures need to be the same size. And the third um, approach is using raw signal as is with uh, deep neural networks. Uh, just feeding the signal as is or somehow averaging it or uh, transforming it with PCA uh, algorithm. And the downside, again, lack of interpretability. Uh, of course, especially if you're applying PCA before trying to reduce the dimensionality, because as I said, EG records, they are very dense. So uh, the frequency, the sampling frequency is very high, like 50 Hertz. So each second of the of the signal is actually 500 data points. So they, it's a very long sequences. And um, oh, from the downsides that we discovered, like ideally we, we want to ha have some algorithm that will uh, imitate the way how people uh, work with uh, EEG records. They visually explore it and looking for some patterns that uh, they can, uh, based on these patterns, some abnormalities, they can classify the EG. So we are looking for the algorithm that would be robust to artifacts and noise. Uh, we also looking for algorithm that would be able to work with uh, sequences of different lengths. So we don't need to specify like, should it be one minute or two? It can be like 10, 15 minutes and even hours of the signal. And we, will, we also want to have uh, uh, patterns of different lengths. So we don't need to specify in advance, like in, in the images, what, uh, what patterns lengths we are looking for. And the fourth and the most important, we are looking for the algorithm that will um, make invertible transformation. So at the end, we will have the opportunity to trace back to original signal to find those local features that cause those or that uh, decisions made by model. And it, the first analogy that comes to mind, uh, so we have a bunch of unstructured data and we need to somehow extract features from this data. And the NLP, a natural language processing domain, has almost the same uh, situation when you have a bunch of text, semi-structured data, and you extract features from this like words or uh, tokens or some sub word parts, and uh, then calculate their frequency and based on these features, then you train some model for text classification. Uh, one of the algorithms that's uh, used in the natural lang language processing called byte pair encoding. It's a pretty old algorithm. It was developed in the 1994, and the, but it's still uh, widespread and utilized in the modern modern like uh, models like GPT-3 and so. It's a very simple algorithm. You just have an input text and you are looking for the most frequent pair of uh, symbols. Uh, on these examples, you may see uh, the most frequent pair here on the first step would be uh, symbols B and A. They appear in the, our corpus of text like two times. It's the most frequent. And we combine them together. And B and A now form a new token B. And we continue this loop, uh, joining emerging uh, symbols into new tokens until we reach um, desired vocabulary size, or we don't have any other options to, to merge. 
uh, those tokens. So um, seems like this algorithm looks like what exactly what we need because it, it, it focused on the local features. So we might suspect it's gonna be robust to artifacts and noise and some uh, outliers and the bursts will not uh, break our model. And uh, this, this uh, algorithm can work with the sequences of various lengths. So it doesn't matter the length, which, uh, the length of the text which you're working with. And uh, it also can discover patterns of various lengths since uh, we shouldn't specify in advance uh, the length of the pattern we are looking for. Uh, it will merge tokens into new tokens. And uh, initially they can be, um, they can have arbitrary length. And uh, this uh, algorithm is fully revertible, so we can uh, trace back to original signal. And um, for the purpose of testing this algorithm, we focus on the age prediction task. So we have EG, with, which is going to be our X, and what is Y? Y in our case is age. Why? Because uh, there are a lot of works in this field. Uh, people trying to predict age and estimate estimate age of the patients based on their EG recordings. And also that's partly the reason because age is a, a like freely available label. So because other labels like diseases, it's this information may be confidential, but age is uh, uh, available. It's not confidential information. So we have a age of the patient for all, almost all uh, EEGs. The data set that we're gonna use uh, is a unique data set. It's uh, a specific uh, of this data set that it contains clinical EEG, the difference from EEGs that uh, taken for, for spe specifically from some experiments. Uh, this EEG was taken uh, in, um, in clinical um, environment, like in hospitals and, and uh, clinics in the Vancouver area. And uh, it was taken through six years it contains more than 7,000 EEG records of various lengths, various patients, males, females, healthy, non-healthy, um, and, the, and the age is almost normally distributed from zero to uh, 100 years. And the uniqueness of this data set that all those EEG was, were taken with the same equipment uh, because uh, it's a very important factor to make those recordings comparable to each other because it's a very dependent on the equipment which is using to um, to take those recordings. And here on the right side, you can see a scheme of the scalp from the top and the uh, names of those channels, uh, means electrodes that we're using as a um, sources of the signal. So we have algorithm, like we have EG, which is, a, is uh, in fact time series. And we want to somehow apply algorithm from natural language processing to automatically find out the most repeating and influential patterns. Uh, it seems like we should somehow convert our signal into text to apply that algorithm. Um, we here utilize the uh, pipeline developed by authors Tawabi and uh, Lerman. They applied recently uh, this byte pair encoding algorithm also to time series data. They have um, data from variable devices like heart rate, step count, um, etc. So uh, we want to expand and uh, with minor adjustments um, reuse their pipeline uh, for EEG data. So first, on the first picture, you can see the original signal. It's a fragment of 40 se 400 seconds from um, one channel of EEG record recording. And uh, the first, what we wanna do is to reduce dimensionality to, some, to somehow discretize uh, our signal. And the first step, we uh, reduce dimensionality by X axis by time. We simply pick a window size of 10, uh, in our case, it's 10 data points. And we just average the value of the signal on this window. Uh, in this way, we persist the shape of the data, we persist some uh, patterns that may present there, but in the same time, we drastically reduce dimensionality. Like now, uh, instead of 200,000 data points, we have only 20,000 data points. And the second step, we uh, wanna discretize, somehow reduce dimensionality by Y axis, by uh, signal value. 
And since um, the EG data, like the signal value is very, uh, it, it varies highly. First, we want to reduce, first, first we want to cut off um, outliers. And we do this by uh, applying like interquantile range and everything. You, you can see those boundaries on the first uh, picture with a dashed line. So everything which lays above or below those lines, we consider to be outliers. And everything between those lines on the second picture, we divide those area, that area into equal sized bins. In our case, it's 20 bins. And uh, uh, to each bin, we assign a specific letter uh, symbol. So in our case, from A to uh, V, uh, it's just here, here, it's not, not all uh, letters, just uh, for a matter of illustration. So in fact, we convert every data point to a specific symbol. So we have, for each recording, we have like 20,000 data points and we convert it into a text file with the length of 20,000 symbols. So we have those texts, uh, like to sum up our pipeline, first we had a lot of EEG recordings. We cleaned them, we applied piecewise ap aggregate approximation, which is uh, exactly averaging uh, in, on the window size. Then we applied symbolization, and the, as a result, we have a data set of TXT files. Then on this TXT, uh, based on these TXT files, we train our tokenizer, which uh, exactly perform this BP uh, byte pair encoding algorithm and uh, learn those tokens, those repeating patterns. And once we have this tokenizer trained, we uh, the, another difference from the original paper, we apply the open source, uh, existing open source solution made by uh, Hugging Face AI community. So then we can convert all TXT files and extract features from uh, those symbolized series. And we, uh, as a features, we treat the frequency of each token. Um, so we count how many times this token appears in the, in the specific series. Then we weight this token by its length. So the, the, the more longer the token is, the more the weight, and uh, normalize it by uh, the length of the whole series. So it, it's going to be, in fact, like percentage of this token in, in, the, in the series. And we do so for each channel, for each electrode separ separately. So the um, number of features or columns in our final dat data set that we are going to use for age prediction is going to be number of um, channels, which is 20 in our case, multiplied by number of tokens, by number of vocabulary for, of the tokenizer. So, and you can see the example of the scheme of the final da data set uh, here on the same picture. And we apply to, to this data set, we train, we train a random forest regressor in order to predict age. We use random forest as the simplest uh, model that can capture nonlinear um, dependency in the data. Here is the result. So uh, in order to measure performance, uh, authors in this domain, they use uh, two metrics. They usually use mean absolute error in years. Uh, so how far their prediction is from actual age. And they use correlation, linear correlation coefficient. Um, so it, the closer it to the one, the, the better. So uh, talking about the figure. So here is the, each point is the prediction from test subset. And uh, ideally, if our model would predict like ideal age, it's gonna be a, a bisector, obviously. So um, as we may see, our model is far away from uh, other best works in this field. There are not so many works to compare, to be honest. And to be honest, they are not really comparable because all of them using this different data set. And um, there is no like benchmark in this field like we have in uh, computer vision or in natural language processing because there is no unified data set on which we everyone can use their approach um, anyway like we have a mean absolute error of uh, 15.7 years which is uh, not bad but 
of course, uh, not very good because uh, average result is around seven uh, years. But we have like 30% of uh, variance explained that it means that our model was able to capture some uh, real life dependencies and to capture some meaningful features. Talking about those features, we also wanted to like validate uh, those, do those features really makes any sense? And we, uh, we tried to uh, correlate um, values of token frequencies with age using distance correlation. Uh, distance correlation is a coefficient uh, ranging from zero to one. And uh, the difference of distance correlation uh, be, uh, from um, Pearson correlation that it, it is able to capture nonlinear dependency. So uh, here you have uh, two plots of uh, two most correlated tokens. So there are a lot of uh, tokens uh, with the same value of distance correlation, but here we're just showing two. And um, each plot presents the average frequency of these tokens uh, with, with each age. So uh, it's like average for, for each age, for, for age of two years, three years, four years. So in total, there is a 100 point on each, uh, on each plot. So we see that there is a clear dependency. Uh, for example, on the first plot, we see that frequency of this token is rising with age to like uh, approximately 20 years, and then constantly declining to the age of 100. For other token, the situation is different. It's a uh, slight, it's uh, frequency is falling to the age of 40 and then rising to, to 100. So the, uh, to, to interpret those tokens, uh, we need like more extensive expertise in neurophysiology to say what those tokens really uh, mean in terms of like health or uh, neurophysiological uh, phenomena. Uh, but we also find out uh, like some surprising stuff for, for us that we were not meant to get is um, uh, special relations that we were able to reconstruct. So we were exploring the same distance correlation across channels to find out which channels are mostly uh, correlated with age. And it appears that uh, we were able to reconstruct the spatial relation between channels. So here is, you can see a scheme of uh, each cell. It represents the uh, channel electrode, uh, the approximate place where it's located on the scalp and average distance correlation of uh, tokens that we obtain from that channels. And it appears that the most correlated tokens we obtain from the back of the head. And the uh, interesting thing that, uh, these values, uh, they have spatial symmetry. So we uh, have a left right hand side, uh, left right side uh, symmetry. And the um, model was able to reconstruct it because the uh, model didn't know anything about how those channels are located or how they like interlocated and they, how are they connected between each other. So uh, here is like for us, it's another proof that uh, our model was, was able to capture some um, na nature of the data and the, some meaningful features. And the last and most important finding that we were emphasizing before, so our model should be interpretable. And here you can see example of, uh, of the same token visualized in different samples in different EG uh, recordings. So we were able to uh, find the exact place in the original data where that specific token is located. And it's uh, very important that uh, the length of this token uh, is actually like 0 0.04 seconds. And uh, this uh, high resolution is extremely important for detecting some short-term events like epileptic spikes. Go so, okay, so yeah, please, uh, my conclusion is gonna stop. Yeah, sorry, sorry. So the, to sum up the main achievements of the, uh, the project that we were able to develop the algorithm that utilized natural language processing 
uh, algorithm uh, to EEG data. And this algorithm is uh, can handle uh, recordings of arbitrary lengths. It can discover uh, also arbitrary length uh, uh, patterns and very short ones. And uh, the model was able to reconstruct spatial relation in the brain. And the uh, most important, the model is interpretable. For the future work, of course, uh, the main drawback of the model is uh, for now is a uh, low accuracy. And here we need to first understand, is it problem with the model or is it problem with the data? Because unfortunately we don't have any other approaches yet applied to the same data set. And it's obviously the, the main direction of for our future work to apply the same algorithm on different time series data and apply different approaches on the same data set that we have. And of course, um, improving the accuracy by hyperparameters tuning, increasing the resolution of our uh, symbolization and using more, um, more sophisticated models instead of random forest for predicting age. And in terms of um, addressing uh, reviewers' comment, like happily, it was mostly positive. The main issue was the lack of conclusions and the discussion uh, in the uh, thesis manuscript. So here I, I'd like to add, add a few more uh, achievements of the project. So we were able to test uh, to, to extend and test the analogy between EG time series and the uh, analogy between texts in NLP and the uh, analogy between patterns that can be found in text and patterns that can be found in a uh, signal and demonstrate that it's, uh, this approach is working and is able to provide meaningful results. Uh, thank you for your attention. Sorry for uh, delay. And uh, now I'd like to відповісти на ваші запитання. Дякую за увагу. Окей, ви можете почати з англійською. Тому, зараз, можете починати з питання. Так, моє перше питання є, що, відповідно, це дуже цікавий розвиток, результати не так проміжні, як для мене. Можете, будь ласка, коментувати на це? І другий питання, може, на наступний питання. Okay, in terms of com comparison with the result, so here is the whole uh, review of related works. The thing is that uh, in, in, uh, in the field of predicting age uh, based on near imaging data, there is not only EEG. People also utilize MRI imaging and fMRI, which is magnetic, uh, like MRT, sorry. Um, so they are not uh, really comparable. And there are a few researchers that utilize EEG data. And they mostly use uh, EEG recorded in uh, like laboratory conditions. And they also utilize classic approaches that we were, we were discussed in the first slides, like extracting calculated features or applying uh, deep learning models. And uh, they models, their model uh, able to provide more accurate result, but they are not able to explain why. So yeah, the, our main goal was to find out the way how to keep model interpretable and at the same time to make model provide some meaningful result. For now, model is providing meaningful result and is interpretable. But of course, uh, accuracy is not satisfactory. And um, it can be a problem with data first, because data is clinical and very dirty. So first, we need to at least separate healthy subjects from not healthy subjects, because uh, these researchers that we, that we compare with, they, use, they train their model on healthy subjects. So they take a population of healthy patient, uh, explore how their mind works and build model in order to predict those. We don't have any labels about whether our patients have diseases or not, but mo mostly they have because they were in a clinic. When you got to the clinic, it, it means that you have something wrong. Uh, and that also can contribute to a low quality of our EEG stuff. So we were trying to 
compensated with the numbers. Um, so yeah, as, as I said, with, with uh, addressing the drawbacks, we need to test the same model, the same approach on different data, maybe even different domain, not even EEG, uh, the know, some financial data. And uh, at the same time, we are working in applying convolutional neural networks on, on the same data set to see how it works. For now, not good, but we are working. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Yes, explainability is really important. The second question is, um, can you please explain the reasons um, for this uh, particular task? I mean, um, to predict uh, the age of, um, of the human, because maybe much more interesting task would be like predict the next action of this uh, human under analysis, or maybe like, uh, um, I don't know, to interpret the uh, action or source, or maybe something like this. So I, I'm about usability of this task, because we proudly know the age of the human and the like, uh, investigation. Yeah, uh, thanks. So there is a two part in answering the, your question. The first one is that we, for, for this specific test, we pick H because H is uniformly available uh, available label. And once we have a model that can understand what's going on inside EEG and somehow predict H, uh, we can transfer the same model to classification for other tasks, for prediction of motions, for um, emotion classification. So there are various tasks for diagnosis of epilepsy or Alzheimer, uh, et cetera. So that's the first thing, um, more practical. And the second thing, uh, in fact, there is some sense in uh, pre exactly predicting age because um, the concept of brain age is like, um, uh, is, is like, you know, uh, people saying like, this, this guy, he is uh, 30 years old, but he has a heart of a 20 years old. So like, it means that the, the heart of this person is healthier and performs better than it should uh, be at his age, for example. And people, the scientists, they're trying to build model that could estimate how uh, brain works based, based on the, its function, on the EEG. So it can be the case that person is uh, 40 years old, but after applying this model, the model will, uh, the model that has usually like very accurate predictions that was trained on the large set of healthy subject. This model will say that, you know, your it looks like your brain works like a brain of 60 years old or 70 years old. So it means like your brain is aging faster than it should. And this, can be used as a tool for uh, early diagnostic and preventive healthcare for um, in neurophysiology. May I continue? Um, actually, that was also a question I wanted to ask. So, Mikola, look, uh, your, your thesis is on brain age prediction. You were talking about age prediction. And now you explain that these are different concepts. So what are you predicting then? Is it brain yeah. age or age? And if it is the, fir the former one, how can you evaluate your model if you don't have brain age? Yeah, that's, that's probably it's a mis uh, misnaming mostly because at the, the, at the beginning I was aiming to predict the brain age, but then uh, in, in consultation with my uh, supervisor, supervisor, we moved to the age. It's, it's true, it's, it's still um, a bit of mystery for myself how people define the exact brain age based on which bio, uh, on, on some biomarkers or so. But the, in the scientific domain, they call it this brain age, uh, this, this task of predicting age, they call it brain, brain age problem. But actually we were like predicting the physiological age, the actual age of the person. So it, it, 
the 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 consensus in the field is like this: if you if you have a healthy population of people with like normally working brain, and uh, you train the model to like accurately predict their actual age, it means that your model now predicting brain brain age. And uh, if you will test some uh, some other patient, uh, this the model will tell how the brain because because the predicting of the age is happening based on information information from the brain so you are actually estimating the age of the brain it, it's it, it's it works like this i, I hope i have ans answered the question. yes uh, i understand but then the question is do you know any extra information in your data it would be reasonable then to train your model on the health of patients, but as you said, mostly you have these records because the patients have some problems with uh, brain functionality. Then <laughs> what, what are you constructing your model for? Uh, on, on the, if, if your data uh, come from people who have some problem with brain, activity, then it cannot predict the actual age at all because this is malfunction of the brain and you are training your model on, 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 on to say your labels, age labels, yeah, I, I, now I, I, have I of li are of little, little importance at all. Yeah, I, I got I got I got the question. So yeah, that's what exactly I, I mentioned before. So why we have so low accuracy? Because we have a bad data. Uh, the main like achievement of the project and the, the goal of the project was to uh, bring up this pipeline that will make this model that can provide interpretable result and uh, analyze EG. So our next step under this project, I hope I will participate in this, to get uh, records on the patient and separate some ambulatory patient from um, non ambulatory Like there are two categories of the patients inside actually. Those who are like, they have diseases for sure. And they are like on the constant, um, on the constant diagnosis. And other, it just like, walk in patients like they have some they might have some symptoms they come to the hospital uh, get, got tested and it appears that they have everything all right so it's it's like more infrastructural problem right now to obtain this data because it's not de-anonymized and it takes time to actually de-anonymize this data and the the next steps would be to separate those who have some severe diseases for, from those who are healthy actually and uh, use only that data uh, for for to to get really a valuable model that can uh, estimate something um, really meaningful for now we just like understand some base the model understands some basics about eg and how brain functioning that that's what model doing right now okay thank you and yeah and um, uh, concerning this uh, you want to detect uh, uh, patterns of different uh, different length but uh, haven't, haven't you tried wavelet analysis or haven't you seen any any research that uses wavelet analysis because wavelets are precisely designed to to tackle these or they can tackle this problem of, of uh, different uh, different uh, periods and, and size length. Yeah, the, the violets, uh, this, this approach uh, fall in, into the category of images. What people do in this domain, usually they uh, deconstruct signal into wavelets and then slice it into uh, frames, into images, and then feed those images into convolutional neural networks. That's the, how they usually use wavelets. So yeah, you're right to, to be, so how, how, they can, that how can, they can be used outside images. I haven't explored much uh, to, to be honest to, to now elaborate on this.
Thank you. Uh, hi, Nicola. Uh, I have a question actually in regards to understanding of the data that you are working on and understanding of the problem that you are working on. So, uh, do you understand what are the time scales that actually you operate with? Like, what is uh, what the kind of brain activities actually determine the age? Like, why have you chosen, for example, window size? Is it like 10 samples to 50 samples that you use for your tokens? Or these are seconds, or can you actually also clarify because it was not clear on your uh, images? Okay, and what yeah. are generally different time scales uh, for different brain activities? Well, so um, every data point in our uh, in uh, in our data is correspond to approximately zero point zero two seconds. So here on this on this example, you see a token that actually contains of two two letters A and E, like after symbolization, and it's uh, it's a reconstruction of the original signal that leads to this token A E. So the the length of this token that contains that uh, combines consists of two sorry consists of two uh, symbols is going to be like 0 0.04 seconds and the most influential um, in the most influential tokens that has the higher correlation with distance correlation with age were usually like two three or four symbols so the the shape of tokens were like like built of two or three letters so to say so it's very short time scales. The, the, the short answer that it's a very short time scales. It's a spikes. It's usually just sudden changes of the of the signal value, either up or down. So some fluctuations, very short term fluctuations. Uh, excuse me. Is it is it the same? Uh, are the same results actually also reported from other uh, authors in the literature? So what the literature review told you, like what, what were the inputs that you started to attack this problem? Have you had any prior knowledge? Uh, because like there are different problems that people study from EEG, for example, mm -hmm. like sleep stages, uh, sleep activity detection and so on. So in that sense, you more or less know what's, what are the time scales you operate with, what should be more or less uh, the window sizes, and then you can like explore that that space of uh, different hyperparameters. So here, at least, I didn't understand if you had this understanding from the from the prior work. Sure. So um, I had some, and the the pre, the prior understanding is that people, the, the researchers, they mostly do not interpret the models. Uh, as as I said, they use those these three approaches mostly. The re re other reviewers, it's not only my review. Other reviewers also divide uh, the approaches into these three categories. So in in fact, you are getting features like the average amplitude of the whole EEG, or the mean signal, or the standard deviation, or you have a network that can predict something based on the spectrogram, but you cannot explore, like you can wait of the, of this, of the network, but you cannot really say what exactly in the signal, some specific place that caused those or that predictions. And that's exactly the novelty and the, the results that we are reporting that our model is able to do so. So we are able to point to a very specific short-term events in the EEG that causing our, in our case, it's age, but it might be some other classification task. So um, yeah, that's, that's what is my current understanding based, uh, our current understanding based on this, based on related works and the results that we get. Did I answer your question? Sorry. More or less, but you know, the, the, like EEG research is a huge field and people were studying it for ages with like informational theory methods, digital signal processing methods and so on. 
And there are a lot of works actually on how to construct low dimensional embeddings in the most optimal way based on informational theory. And from that, like usually, as far as I know from the industry standards, like from some startups who work in this field. So they start by actually optimizing the low dimensional, uh, like finding the low dimensional embedding, not working with the raw signal. And the, here they use some pre-processing steps from digital signal processing, like take, like taking out all the noise that you might have there and then starting like some deep learning methods. And in that way, you at least are safe on the part that you actually work with the kind of most important features of the signal. Mm -hmm. But, but here, again, um, I'm sorry. not really sure if you, like when you start like applying this tokenization to the, to the raw signal, if this actually uh, does, like if the noise that you have in the signal, if all, all that crap that you might have like from the poor, um, uh, con like contacts uh, not very well contacting the skin and so on, like if that actually does not really corrupt your results much. Yeah, so it, it can corrupt, uh, of course, but again, this algorithm is, is focused on local features. And if signal is corrupted in some part, in one of the channels or in some specific place, we... It, it doesn't break it mostly. And we actually, we apply uh, a very, very basic cleaning, cleaning for the data. Like- uh, Did you do some uh, autocorrelation analysis? For example, analyzing what is the typical correlation lengths in the, in the signal? To understand like what, what is actually, uh, what are the time scales I should work with? Um, not really. So the, the, the goal is going a bit back, sorry for, for your previous comment. You said that usually people uh, building models, uh, be, the first step is to build some embedding space. Uh, yes, some low dimensional features. For example, you might have these uh, high dense signals with like 500 Hertz sampling mm -hmm. and like many channels. And then you want to build actually some feature vector containing like 128, for example, features. And then you start like you further work with this vector for, for a single second, for, for example. Yeah, to be honest, I, I'm not really aware of, uh, of works like this, but the thing is that th those models will, won't be interpretable again. So here we would like to build uh, support decision support system for physicians because look 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 uh, it's you are poorly actually understanding what is interpretable interpretable is when I actually see some specific feature in the signal and I can actually uh, link the specific feature in the signal to to my result here I don't see that actually you do uh, you actually have this interpretability here much so you still can have low dimensional representation of your signal using some, let's say, uh, diffusion maps or something like that. So which actually would provide you a very kind of un clear understanding of what you have in your signal on the low dimensions uh, representation. And then uh, you, in principle, you can also build the same tokenization procedure on top of that. And that will be absolutely the same logic. But you will already work with like highly refined features, not, not with this uh, very dense data that you have at the moment. Okay, can I ask, are those methods uh, allows people to then to pointing to a specific place in the EEG, in the original EEG that has caused some prediction? Yes, you can review, actually revert those methods as well. Okay, that sounds so, sounds really promising. Shall we move on? Yep, yep. Um, do you have a question? Probably a short one. Uh, on the short one, a very, very short question. Can you show the diagram is uh, uh, visualization, visualization of relationship with uh, actual age and predicted age? I mean, this uh, connection is very linear. So you just have like uh, mismatching uh, slope of uh, 
regression line. So why you don't apply some transform linear transformation like rotation, for example, and just improve your results? If you know if you know the actual size, why, why do you not do this? Um, I'm not sure that it, it worked that way. The, the thing is, I think it's the statistical and it's, if your model will not predict anything, it will be just horizontal line. So if if model doesn't work and it, it will it throw the same. But, but, but can you agree that if you just remove uh, patients uh, uh, older than 80 and uh, younger than, uh, for example, 40, you will improve your results? Uh, for sure, yeah. But uh, uh, why you why you doing this? Uh, it doesn't correspond to the goal of the research. So <laughs> the goal wasn't to be to 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 report some mean uh, average. Like I would even I would more play with the with the plot first. I would adjust axis. I would adjust uh, something else to make the plot looks really uh, more promising and the data more related. What I what I saw in yeah, other but it's your metric. It's like your 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 goal is to lower this metric to meet SOTAX at least. But you you have like uh, uh, fifteen, yeah, mean absolute error. And the SOTA is like seven, so you 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 can't meet the the SOTA with this approach. Yeah, so maybe you should choose another metric uh, to to show the idea. But okay, yeah, so. My... Yeah, the, meeting the SOTA wasn't the, the goal, yeah, to, to be clear. Maybe, maybe that's the reason. Okay, thank you, Mikola. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the question. So thank you so much for uh, sharing your presentation. And uh, we move to our second uh, speaker is, uh, is uh, Theodor Romanos. So Theodor. Let's check your mic. Питання всім, слава Україні. Не нормально чути? Так, вас чути. Добре. Дуже дякую. Дякую попередньому. Нагадаю, Теодор, ви маєте 20 хвилин, будь ласка, вкладайтеся в цей час. Можете розпочати. Дуже постараюся. Та, дуже дякую попередньому спікеру за цікаву презентацію. Я переключусь на англійську і продовжувати з цієї точки. My name is Theodore and I'm presenting my master thesis work generalizing texture transformers for super resolution and in painting. The thesis supervisor is Roman Rezantsev. The plan of the presentation is to give an introduction to the project domain and the research objectives, then to introduce the chosen architecture and quality metrics, after that present research hypotheses. The evaluation part shows data sets and experiments with the following discussion. Conclusions and future work summarizes the, the work. The research area is, uh, of, the, of the thesis is image super resolution and computer vision. The image super resolution is a technique to enhance resolution of images. The research tasks here are reference-based super resolution and in painting. So the first, uh, the reference-based super resolution aims to recover high resolution images by using external reference images uh, containing similar content to generate high resolution features and high resolution textures. Uh, for example, here we want to increase the resolution of the left image by using high resolution information of the patch of the central patch of this image. Uh, and uh, the high resolution result is shown to the right. The in painting task is to restore the damaged or missing parts of images. For example, here in the left image, some pixels are painted white and uh, the result of restoring these pixels uh, is shown to the right. Our motivation for doing these tasks, for doing super resolution and in painting problems uh, comes from the real world. There are many applications, software applications, which do in painting. And the widespread of multi-camera phones gives us possibility to try to solve in painting and super resolution tasks at the same time, simultaneously. The research objectives 
are to evaluate the ability of the chosen uh, network or the chosen architecture texture transformer network to solve super resolution and banking tasks explore ways to improve the model accuracy uh, prove this hypothesis experimentally and compare the texture transformer network with different solutions so a short background to reference by super resolution is uh, that uh, the whole area started uh, in 90s and early 2000s with patch-based algorithms where multiple patches in input and reference images were being compared. Uh, was after the development of neural networks, uh, they started uh, using uh, convolutional neural networks uh, to solve this task. Around five, year five years ago, uh, generated or serial networks or GANs were used, uh, were showing the best results in the field. And uh, nowadays, today, transformer networks show the best result in the area. For our, for our research, uh, we chose the transformers architecture because it's the state of the art in the RefSR task now. Uh, the main feature of a transformer model is that it learns context by tracking relationships and sequential data, like uh, words in text or pixels in images. Um, transformer model models detect data dependencies uh, by using the attention mechanism. This mechanism was introduced first in 2017 in the paper, attention is all you need in the natural language processing area first. And shortly after it appeared that it can be used in computer vision as well. Texture transformer network for image super resolution is a state of the art architecture in reference based super resolution task right now. That's why we chose this, uh, this architecture to be used in our research. Um, Texture Transformer Network, or TTSR in short, is a network which does super resolution via texture transfer. Uh, it uses the already mentioned attention mechanism to transfer features uh, from the input image, from the reference image to the input image to produce high reference results. Um, the network has trainable feature extractor, which transfers features to a subspace where they can be best transferred. Uh, the rest architecture consists of the hard attention module used for the texture transfer and the final transformer levels for generating high resolution image. The network uses a combination of losses for training. Uh, first, reconstruction loss, which is a simple mean square error between the expected and actual images. Then perceptual loss, which is uh, the distance between images in, the, in some featured space and last, the adversarial loss to train the generative part of the network. Here's an example of the texture transformer network uh, provided by the authors of the paper. The left image is an input image, and uh, the network increases its resolution by transferring pixels from the reference image. And the result is shown at, as the third image. Uh, for evaluating uh, the quality of our network, we are going to use three quality metrics uh, from two groups, pixel-based metrics and feature-based metrics. Pixel-based compare pixels and images. And the first one is PSNR, peak signal to noise ratio. And it measures the reconstruction quality of images. And the second is SSIM, structural similarity index. It assesses the perceived, hum the human perceived quality of images. And the feature-based metric, uh, FID, Freshe inception distance, it assesses a generative model images quality. And the first two metrics, uh, higher is better, and the third metric, lower is better. So when we started doing the research, the research gap was that uh, there were no known solutions to super resolution and painting tasks simultaneously by using texture transformer network or any transformer networks at all to our knowledge. And our research hypotheses were that uh, the first and the main hypothesis is that TTSR can solve the super resolution and the painting task simultaneously in one pass. And all next hypotheses are modifications to the model. And these are our um, tries to increase the model accuracy or to explore uh, the model capabilities to solve our tasks. And I'm going to go uh, briefly through all of them during the experiments. And 
also we want to compare our model to the uh, to other solutions in the area and since the novelty of our research is adding in painting to super resolution architecture we'll evaluate the in painting task by comparing our network to the state of the art in painting network um, the palette network is a state of the art in painting network architecture it uses the diffusion model to solve uh, the in painting task it is an iterative algorithm and outperforms all previous in painting tasks so moving to the evaluation part, um, we needed to find the data set for our tasks and the data set should be able to solve both super resolution and painting tasks at the same time. And to the best of our knowledge, there are there's no such data set available. So we needed to generate one. The selected data set is a combination of two data sets, the SRO data set and the QD IMD data set. First, the SRO data set or super resolution row uh, consists of 500 scenes and each scenes each scene has seven images taken from the camera in the same spot but with different focal lengths for example uh, the top left and the second top left images show an example of a zoomed out pair of images basically this gives us the same scene in multiple resolutions which we can use for super resolution task a closer here's a closer look to the data set uh, we have multiple resolutions of the same scene. And for the super resolution task, we're going to use such pairs of images, like first and second, uh, second and third, and so on. For the in painting task, we chose a quick draw irregular mask data set, or QDIMD. It contains binary and black and white image masks, which are actual human drawings. This data set is already used for in painting in um, multiple other works. Uh, and uh, the way we, we are going to apply it to our task is that uh, we can overpaint white pixels from this mask to the previous SR row images and simulate image damages this way. Um, here's an example of the train data set and how it uh, looks like on our side. It contains of three images two input images, the low resolution input and high resolution reference image and the ground truth image. We know that we solve both super resolution and in painting tasks simultaneously by the data set design. And uh, both images partially, both input and reference images partially overlap. So the low resolution image have textures to transfer from. And in painting mask is applied to 60% of images uh, so that the model can train for both in painting only and the mixed task. The images resolution, the output images resolution is 256 by 256, and the input image resolution is equivalent to or similar to 192 to 192. Also, uh, for the test data set, um, we want for our model to solve our tasks not only on one data set, but on all data sets. So we took the second image data set, uh, Flickr Faces HQ, to, to uh, evaluate the quality of our solution. This data set consists of facial images. And it is quite different from the SRO data set in the way that it doesn't contain pairs of images. So we'll construct low resolution images by downsampling the original images. Now, uh, going to the practical to the experimental part, and it started uh, like as a part of the research, we reproduced the original paper results. Um, we got the uh, original paper code and the data set, trained it for the experiments, explained in the paper, and uh, obtained the same matrix as reported in the paper. Uh, the paper authors, they measure PSNR and SCM of their model, they don't measure FID, which I'm measuring in the experiments too. Um, the results reproduce the paper so we can use our, uh, this architecture to solve our tasks. So going to the main experiments, um, the first experiment is uh, basically the main experiment where we evaluate the ability of the texture transfer network for to solve uh, super resolution and in painting tasks. The results of the test data set are, are shown in the table. 
below. Uh, here we compare the TTSR model accuracy and accuracy of not applying the network at all. And by, by saying that, I mean that we compare low resolution damage damage with the high resolution expected image and compute these metrics this way. And the results show a visible improvement of all metrics. Once again, PSNR and SCM lower, higher is better and for FID lower is better. Um, and uh, the example images show that the network is uh, solving our tasks as well. First two columns are uh, input images. The third image, the third column is network result. Uh, and the last image is ground truth. And the, the first line, we can see that uh, super resolution works successfully. And in the second line, we can see that the in-painting task is solved very well too. Uh, next, we wanted to evaluate the model capabilities to solve the super resolution in painting task. Um, the, first the first hypothesis is that it's possible to reduce the embedding size of texture transformer network and preserve its accuracy. The motivation for changing the embedding size comes from this paper, Attention is All You Need, the, fund the foundational paper of all transformers. Uh, and the, the authors of that of that paper used embedding size of 600, while the authors of TTSR chose it to be four times larger, 2,304. We experimented with uh, smaller embedding sizes, uh, 1,152, 576, and 288 embedding sizes. And the results show that the embedding size of 576 um, is still showing very nice metrics. BSNR and SSIM are similar to the original model, while FID got even better. This means that the model is trained for generate, gen, generative component better. Smaller, smaller than 576 embedding sizes result in worse model accuracy. In summary, by reducing the embedding size by four times, we are still able to have the same accuracy as the original model. And as an additional benefit, uh, the model training time decreases from 24 to 20 hours. Another improvement to the model we tried is uh, that we used soft attention for feature transfer instead of the original hard attention. We do that because the authors of attention is all you need use soft attention as well. And uh, below you can see the validation metrics. So we trained the model for 500 epochs and recorded PSNR and SCM for each epoch. Blue line is the original model and the red line is the modified model. And the results uh, show that soft attention was trained almost the same as the original model. And uh, the testing metrics are also, also show that. This means uh, that we can use both soft attention and hard attention for our tasks interchangeably, but for different tasks, one or another approaches might be more optimal. So we cannot confirm the hypothesis that soft attention can increase network accuracy, uh, at least at this moment for this task and this configuration. The last modification we tried was to apply linear projections to the input and reference image before computing the attention map. Um, here, the original model is blue, and trainable projections is dark blue. The results show that for SSIM, the trainable projections uh, stop improving at the very beginning of the training. And this means that um, the model cannot improve the structural information of an image over, over time, over training. At the same time, increasing PSNR and not increasing SSIM uh, typically means that the model started producing blurred results. And it can be shown in, in the images. So here's an example of all networks working together at one of the images that was shown previously. The first line are, explains inputs, uh, and the second line uh, shows four experiment outputs for the same image. You can see that TTSR, TTSR with reduced embeddings, and TTSR with soft attention all show very good super resolution results. And uh, the modification with trainable projections doesn't show progress in super resolution uh, well. Though they all solve the in-painting task really, really nice. 
the quality metrics, they also confirm uh, that uh, first three experiments show similar PSNR and SSIM and FID, while trainable projections show uh, worse results. The last experiment was to uh, evaluate and compare our model with another in-painting network for the in-painting task. We slightly modified the data set to focus on the in-painting task first. We increased the uh, damaging mask being applied and removed uh, input and reference images overlap for the test data set. The resulting metrics were computed only for the in-painted pixels. Um, here we can see that SSIM results are very similar, and it shows that both models recover the structural information in images really well. But the large FID difference shows that the generated or serial part of the palette network performs uh, much better. This might be because we trained our model or on 5,000 images, while um, palette trained it for by, by using 10 million images they use the place to data set which is really large one and also the model or the plot model is is uh, bigger in size it has more weights and uh, lastly the huge difference in psnr can be best explained by by an example on on the visualization example uh, here you can see the results of work of the ttsr and the palette networks the first line shows that our model solves the in painting task really well and uh, that's mostly how most of the test images look like. And the next two lines show some drawbacks of the networks. The second line shows that for thin, for very thin lines, palette may sometimes um, produce artifacts while we deal with such cases really well. And the third line shows a drawback of our model. When the reference image doesn't contain textures to transfer, high resolution textures, uh, the network may change colors of an image slightly. Uh, here you can see that um, TTSR slightly changed colors while uh, Palette uh, didn't. This change causes our PSNR metric to be really uh, different or not, not that well as we expected it to be. It's worth to mention that we still solved the in-painting task really well. Um, this experiment concludes the practical part of the work. In conclusion, uh, we obtained the next results. First, the texture transformer network indeed can be used for just solving the super resolution and painting task simultaneously. Second, the model can be further improved. We can reduce the embedding size and preserve the model accuracy this way. Uh, using soft attention shows similar res results and trainable projections don't show satisfying results in the experimental set. We also showed that the model can successfully solve the in-painting task by comparing it to the in-painting network. The future work uh, in, in this thesis would be to investigate the in-painting capabilities of the solution more by uh, in-painting larger parts, larger chunks of, of images or to use larger data set for in painting. Uh, also, it's, it's really interesting to investigate the trainable projections experiment. And one of the suggestions that we have that might improve the model accuracy is to use multi-headed attention. And um, also we didn't include this experiment uh, here and in the master thesis uh, would be nice to evaluate super resolution capabilities after training the model for in painting. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, these are some future work in the field. And uh, here's the reviewer feedback. And I'm really grateful to the reviewer for the constructive feedback. Uh, I applied, I hope I, I tried to apply the most of the uh, comments in the review. So I, I replaced the network for the comparison with a state-of-the-art network. I added a uh, generative part-specific matrix, or the metric which is widely used in the in-painting field. 
and I also introduced a separate data set for testing so that there's no confusion between the validation and test data set. And I uh, clarified uh, more uh, ideas on why, why do I think the trainable projections didn't work well. Um, also, it's important to know that uh, we use the same model weights. So we share the whole model weights for the whole, uh, for both tasks. And uh, the reviewer uh, mentioned that uh, typically different heads are used for different tasks so that the model has both shared weights and task specific weights. And this totally makes sense. And uh, it's another future work to address. Uh, the current uh, experiments were motivated by us exploring, researching a uh, different solution. But then we found that uh, having all model shared weights uh, solves both tasks together. So we evaluated the solution as is. But I believe that by, use, by having task specific weights, the model accuracy can be improved even further. Yeah, that's, uh, that's all that I have uh, to share with you. Thanks for, for listening. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, so let us switch to the Q&A session. Uh, Ross, will you start? Yes. Uh, OK, so uh, as for me, uh, it lacks in your uh, report uh, like details of how the, if I understand right, the classical TTSR network uh, very extended uh, should i see the code and it all uh, you, you can answer or you can visual, visualize these extensions in some other way um yeah so um we had uh three extensions of the network so first we wanted to model our task by modeling a data set for the task so yeah, let me go to the Sample slide. So we incorporated both super resolution and in painting knowledge in the input image. It is a low resolution image with some damaged parts. And we haven't changed any of the network architecture at all for the uh, baseline experiment. For the experiments two, three, and four, we applied some modifications to the model. And they are really briefly explained here, and they are explained in more details in the uh, work itself, but they were all related to the attention module of the model. And they, so we were changing the attention slightly by uh, changing the texture transfer mechanism by adding more layers before the attention. And this way we hope to get a um, better texture transfer this way. Um, okay, but there, there... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 really hard for me to 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 visualize those changes. But uh, when when you when you commented that, I noticed that that would be beneficial for for your understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, if I understand right, experiments were uh, independent from, from each other. Yeah. And so what is the final structure of your network of your proposed network? So my question is, is it Appendix A and code like should answer questions or you can add something? Yeah, so uh, we had four main experiments and we had four model architectures. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, structure of the attention module is uh, shown in the Appendix A. So there, there are four different attention modules presented there in part. And okay. they show the only modifications we apply to the network architecture. Uh, but there is no one final model which is the best from all of this. So from my uh, understanding uh, and from the metrics that they show, the best uh, model is the model that shows the best results and is trained, what has trained and inference time the best. And this is the model with the reduced embedding uh, size from the experiment number two. Okay. And, and I would use it for the further experiments. Okay. Uh, and the second question is, uh, if you know um, one of uh, Ukrainian Catholic University graduates, or Skupin solved uh, this very similar task. And if you know, can you compare the results, please? So, uh, 
I heard about some some work of a stop, uh, and uh, I, I I I didn't have chance to to closely investigate the difference, the differences okay. of our solutions. Okay. I mostly focused on comparing uh, our model to the original uh, network and to the state of the art network. Because uh, he solves the task of uh, uh, extending resolution and have very like uh, promising results. So why why I am asking about it? Okay, thank you. Yes. So in fact, we used uh, really a lot of the models uh, to compare our solution. I see. So let me show you one more. So we also uh, used the Edge Connect network to compare our model with. This is not the state of the art network is from 2019 but it it's widely used for comparison so if you open uh, any, any or many in painting papers they use edge connect as a very good baseline but the reviewer mentioned that uh, it's not state of the art so we we um, didn't we, we, we didn't include it in the final uh, work of the final part of the uh, diploma okay okay thank you So Thank you. Other questions? Both. Hi, Ted. I, I have actually two questions. The first one, if you if you can articulate clearly what is the advantage of using texture transformer network in comparison to other state-of-the-art methods? Um, so we explored a way. So the, the main novelty of this work is a multitask network, which can solve both tasks at the same time. And uh, we just got a uh, state-of-the-art network from one of the fields, and we tried to apply it in both fields. And here's the, that's, that's the result we got. So if you ask why did we use texture transformers and not something different like GANs or I don't know, uh, fusion models is that because uh, I personally am really excited about this uh, this network architecture and uh, I, I want I wanted to explore it from the very bottom to the very top and it it is clearly a state of the art one in the in the reference based super resolution. Okay, but at the end we we see that the results are worse than actually. Uh, mm -hmm. The arts uh, networks which have focused oh. on yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yes. uh, yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, I want to comment on that. Typically, the uh, accuracy of a single task network may be uh, a lot better than the uh, accuracy of a multitask network. And okay. uh, that's, that's why. Uh, yeah. So, uh, how much effort, or maybe maybe you did this experiment but did not put in the diploma? If I take any of the networks that other state of the art networks that you compared to as a benchmark, so if I retrain them for multitask, so would the results be worse, better, how they would compare to texture transformer network? Yeah, I believe that's a separate work on its own, to be honest. That's what we did with texture transformer network. But if you if you're asking like on the uh, retraining the network, that's a part of the diploma too. So we took the texture transformer network weights for the super resolution task only. And we used this, th these weights to retrain our model to, to the uh, multitask network. And the results we observed is that almost uh, after, after a few epochs, after like a, a 50 epochs, the model accuracy got improved to the like 500 epochs of our, 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 our all other models, which were trained uh, from the weights from some some random distribution or from, from the normal distribution. Okay, another quick question. So, so again, in the, in the comparison of different networks, so can you estimate uh, what is like the computational com complexity of running different networks? For example, how TTN compares to that palette network in terms of, for example, if I want to run it on the mobile device. 
yeah so that was one of the our motivations to to do and that was from what we started this research we wanted to run all this on the mobile phone and uh right now uh, the inference time of the texture transformer network is something close to one second or something less 0.7 seconds on my computer on, on my computer and our phones are not that uh, weaker as our computers nowadays so i believe the time would be comparable and regarding palette network each in inference time of one image was i don't know 100 seconds or more because that's an iterative uh, algorithm and it needed it needed to apply like a thousand iterations of refinement and it took uh, eternity so our model can potentially be used in the mobile phones probably in a shorter time frame than the diffusion models, for example. Mm -hmm. And in comparison to that Edge Connect? Uh, I, I, I cannot exactly uh, give, you, give you this information right now. I, I, from from uh, my experience, Edge Connect had 10 more, uh, the size of the Edge Connect network was 10 times larger than the TTSR network. So TTSR is seven megabytes and uh, Edge Connect was 70 megabytes of uh, the network. And the inference time was uh, uh, slightly slower, but uh, I, I don't have any specific numbers right now. Okay, so that, that might be actually explaining your motivation, why you took TTN in comparison to other networks, why we still need to research in this area. Yeah. So this is just a just just an introduction on 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 all that. Thank you. Does he have more questions? Okay. So uh, thank you so much, Theodore. We done with your presentation, uh, and now we have a break for thirty minutes, and come back here at noon. Thank you so much. Так. <laughs>
Мар'яна, ви з нами? Так, добрий день. Ага, давайте вмикайте камеру і я тут зупиняю спільшаю. Тихо будьте, бо тут трансляція на нічого буде. Ми говорити зараз. Ми говоримо про глобальні речі. Так, можете ширити свій екран. Я не справа шахту просто. Тепліше, ніж у Львові там. У нас теж 36. Так, добре. Давайте я запишу запис. Добре, Мар'яна, можемо починати. Нагадаю, ви маєте 20 хвилин для доповіді. Будь ласка, намагайтесь не сильно перейти за цей час. І так, можете стартувати. Будь ласка. Гаразд. Добре, я перейду на англійську одразу. Greetings, good afternoon everyone. My name is Marian Petruk and I present my master thesis titled Multi-Temporal Satellite Imagery Panoptic Segmentation of Agricultural Land in Ukraine, which I conducted with supervision of Dr. Zdras Firma. We will start with our motivation in the given research field, describe to the listener important background information on the topic, set the problem definition, describe data sets we used and present methods in the approach part. We will outline the experiments we conducted with French and Ukrainian data, present the results of our research. Finally, we will discuss the most important findings, application scenarios and suggest possible future advancement for the research direction. So many countries have had open farmland markets for years, providing economic growth, investments, more jobs and greater productivity. In the USA, France and China, there are already developed methods to help farmers analyze land using satellite imagery. However, in Ukraine, such a market opened just in 2021. While remote sensing for farmland is a known problem and research direction globally, almost no existing work, uh, works use, use Ukrainian cropland data. The second factor is the open access to satellite imagery data. It has given research worldwide a new way to conduct various observation tasks, including uh, using space exploration technology, for example, to analyze Earth's resources, monitor local changes of the land and study climate change. Third, land cover mapping using traditional rule-based classification methods with handcrafted features is difficult to do accurately. So deep learning has recently been introduced to classify land cover utilizing automated feature extraction and showed a significant potential for high resolution multispectral imagery. Uh, so, some background information uh, about the satellite images. There are some specificities of it. So high resolution, they are 100 by 100 square kilometers. Uh, they have multiple channels of different spatial resolution. They are multi-temporal and have cloud occlusions. So one satellite image can cover up to 10,000 square kilometers and such images are different from common photos we use every day. Uh, the satellite produces 13 spectral bands um, or channels or with different resolution and uh, therefore one needs to process them to have a common size. Satellite images are often used as a stacked multi-temporal sequences. Uh, the, res the research community suggests this may improve the performance um, of the particular downstream task. 
And uh, of course, cloud coverage needs to be addressed while working with satellite images, as in different geographic locations, clouds may cover up to 80% of the time during the year. So let's begin with the problem statement. Image segmentation is a computer vision problem that aims uh, to assist in image analysis. And one type of image segmentation is panoptic segmentation. So panoptic segmentation may be considered as a combination of semantic segmentation, as we see here. So classifying each pixel of the image with a specific class and instance segmentation. Uh, you may see here delineation of all individual objects in, of the, on the image. And in the context of satellite imagery, for example, um, semantic class is a particular crop type of a parcel, for example, corn, barley, sunflower, while instance class represents a unique parcel marking its contour on the Earth's area of analysis. Here we show a high level idea of the problem we solve. For the input, we have multi temporal, multi channel satellite images. Uh, for the output, we obtained panoptic predictions for a given agricultural land uh, with parcels separated and crop type uh, classified. We want to stress to the listeners that uh, panoptic segmentation is only introduced to the agro domain by Gernu and Landrieu. Therefore, um, there are no other works present to solve this problem yet. Uh, therefore, we were motivated to reproduce the work from the paper, from the only paper uh, that solves this problem and adopt it to Ukraine. So we pose the following research questions. Is it necessary to use multi-temporal satellite imagery? How multi-temporality of satellite imagery uh, time series influence the model performance? What is the difference between Ukrainian and French agricultural land? Whether we can improve and adopt approach proposed by Gun Ryu and Landryu in 2021 to Ukraine. So let's discuss the data set we used. First data set we used is named Pastis. This data set has panoptic labels for multi-temporal satellite imagery patches covering approximately 4,000 square kilometers of French. It has 18 crop types annotated with 10 meters per pixel resolution, 2 billion pixels in total. So color represents a particular crop class, while edges represent separate parcel delineation. In our research, we started with this data set as our main data set due to its rich annotations, large area and European region in which we are most interested in. Next, let's talk about Ukraine. After our research and discussions with industry, we may conclude that, to the best of our knowledge, that uh, there are no publicly available data sets with panoptic annotations for Ukrainian farmland. We want to stress to the listeners that Ukraine is a global food exporter, contributing to 42% of sunflower oil traded on the global market, 16% of maize and 9% of wheat. Therefore, we believe that there is a dire need for a similar data set to pass this, publicly available to have a near future, as the farmland market in Ukraine has been recently opened and such a data set is crucial for data science applications to accelerate economic growth in Ukraine. Thankfully, one businessman, a farmland owner who decided to remain anonymous, provided us with some of his raw archival uh, spreadsheets and cropland polygon maps. Therefore, inspired by past this French dataset, we conducted multiplex data engineering steps to construct a similar dataset as past this for Ukrainian cropland. First, as um, in the data parcels um, we have uh, were scattered throughout Ukraine and due to limits in hardware, we wanted to use the storage and compute resources we have in the most efficient manner. For this, we conducted clustering to have clusters with the biggest parcel density. Uh, we obtained seven clusters. The proposed Ukrainian data has around 700 parcel polygons scattered throughout Ukraine. We sampled the parcels with crop types similar to the biological uh, taxonomy to the pastis, and after mapping, we ended up with six crops uh, for 2018 crop yield. In the figure, one may see the red rectangles where the fields are located and green in the region are the regions of the loaded satellite images. Next, let's discuss with the pipeline. So as a baseline, uh, as we already mentioned for our experiment, we use the first end-to-end -end deep learning method for panoptic segmentation of satellite images, time series named Paracelis Points, developed by Garnu and Landryu. The author developed two sub-modules. The first module um, of the pipeline is a feature extractor of the, or the spatial temporal encoder named UTM. It reminds of a well-known UNET network for its U-shaped design. The feature encoder we, uh, we used also has an encoder as a contractive pass and a decoder as expansive pass. There are three parts to the module spatial encoder, temporal encoder, and spatial decoder. 
a convolution encoder first uh, encodes each image of the four-dimensional tensor in the feature extractor. The next is we collapse the temporal dimension into a single representation to achieve, and to achieve this, um, an attention-based method pro processes temporal dimension only at the lowest feature map resolution and for the uh, upscales it to the all the uh, feature levels uh, feature resolution levels finally the spatial temporal feature uh, extractor produces four feature maps and then passes them forward to the panoptic segmentation model so this second model is called parcel as points it was inspired by center net and center mask methods it is used here for producing panoptic segmentation masks as instance segmentation with respective uh, class crop type for from four uh, multi-scale uh, feature maps returned by the previous uh, module. So in brief, uh, the module predicts tentative centers of the parcels. Uh, you may see on the centerness heat map, then pixel values of the centers from all feature maps are, are combined uh, in one vector and three MLPs uh, return a rough shape of the parcel, size of the parcel and crop uh, class. Then resized parcel shape is combined with a saliency map uh, some kind of attention and uh, produces a finally binary prediction uh, result. For, for the objective function, uh, there is a combination of four loss functions to supervise the model uh, optimization process, uh, to supervise uh, parcel centers, crop class, uh, size of the parcel, and uh, shape. Uh, I omit the detailed formulas. Uh, they are in my thesis and I can explain them. Uh, if there will be questions, now I am skipping due to a uh, shortage of time. For the quantitative evaluation, we used panoptic metrics developed by Kirillov and others in 2018, uh, when they introduced actually panoptic segmentation problem to the computer vision domain. So panoptic quality is calculated over uh, for each class and is averaged all, over all classes. Mm, this metric is a combination of segmentation quality uh, for instance segmentation measurement and recognition quality for accuracy of the crop type classification. Now let's uh, talk about our experiments and results. So first we uh, would like to answer uh, how multi-temporality influences the performance. So here we see um, that first we reproduce the results uh, and obtain similar uh, performance like 39.37 uh, in the paper and 39.43 uh, we reproduced. They are uh, very close and we uh, agree that this is, uh, method is uh, reproducible. Then uh, actually to the experiment we used uh, instead of, uh, of multi-temporal um, component we use only one single timestamp uh, for the each patch. And um, uh, as we see for example uh, the results have, man, have less fields uh, listed. Uh, and also the uh, crop uh, class classification is not uh, like accurate, uh, as we see with the multi-temporal information. There are uh, more uh, crop types uh, available. And also quantitatively, we see that all, all, almost two times uh, reduced in panoptic quality uh, when we use only single uh, timestamp instead of multi-temporal. So in multi-temporal, we use from 33 to 61 uh, timestamp uh, through, through one year. And next, uh, while we're trying to improve the uh, baseline performance, uh, we observed that this shape predictor uh, has uh, is very simple. It uses only one pixel from all feature maps. And we thought why we use only one pixel if we have the this spatial component. This is spatial, not the vector representation. So we develop a unit like decoder. For this, uh, we, re we replaced uh, this shape estimator set of MLP um, to be as unit decoder. However, uh, we were surprised that the performance is not improved. Um, however, we still believe that spatial information is important and only one pixel uh, value for predicting the whole parcel. Also, we experimented with micro design architecture and inspired by recent papers, um, change of activation function helps uh, boost the performance. And we tried um, default common ReLU. Uh, next, we tried uh, Gaussian error linear unit and MISH. Uh, as we see, uh, ReLU showed the highest performance. However, 
if we see not only test uh, split but also train, uh, Jelu actually shown uh, almost 10% boost in panopti quality on train. So this can be further addressed and uh, experimented with. Also, we tried a different channel uh, data channel modalities. So as we were using only 10 bands, we thought why why shouldn't we add elevation, for example, because flat is not uh, because surface is not flat. Uh, we added the uh, 11th channel like this, uh, and to our surprise, the metrics are it it, it bit improved. So, for example, in segmentation quality, uh, but it's not uh, as high as we expected. And also, we tried uh, to reduce the, the bands to improve the efficiency. So, for example, why we use 10, maybe we can use less, as the first five bands uh, are responsible for the um, uh, agro information. And uh, indeed, we see the very high accuracy with using only five bands. All, all, all we improved in segmentation quality. However, we have uh, less panoptic quality results. And uh, yes, this signifies that indeed, first five bands have the most important information. Uh, next to Ukraine. So um, uh, we tried first uh, of, with our created data sets data set and uh, we tested and obtained the following results. So if you use without training, we have only 1.32% of panoptic quality uh, with model trained on France. If we uh, use Ukrainian data normalization because uh, we need to change the normalization uh, in each uh, data, in each country, in each different geographic location, and we obtained uh, 0.8. Uh, of panoptic quality. And uh, while when we retrain on Ukraine, we have 1.52%. Uh, it is higher than our previous uh, experiments, but it is not uh, very good. However, in segmentation quality, we already saw 40%. Uh, if you look visually, uh, here we have very good delineation for this particular uh, parcel. However, as we see the classification and the actual instance segmentation uh, is not is far from ideal and we thought why why this is happening so why we cannot like train uh, train on ukrainian data and indeed we observed the difference so we computed statistics uh, of the area parcels and uh, we saw that for ukrainian data having the same spatial resolution as in past is the average uh, parcel area is uh, 200,000 uh, meters squared, uh, while in French, uh, parcels are only like 10,000 meters squared, so very small. So uh, to combat this, we artificially rescaled our uh, data, our Ukrainian data to 30 meters per pixel to reduce the uh, uh, parcel average area. And also visually, you may see that this uh, yellow uh, rectangles are the same uh, size. However, in French, we have uh, almost 100 fields in one patch. In Ukraine, we have only one or two fields present in one patch. So in Ukraine, we have very large uh, parcels. And indeed, the performance improved when we retrained with uh, 30 meters per pixel rescaled. We have 34% 30, of segmentation quality and 6% of panoptic quality. And indeed, you may see that uh, the segmentation is improved, uh, very, very similar to the ground truth you may see in this column. Uh, while French data set uh, has, man, has 18 crop types, in Ukraine we have only six, and therefore uh, you may see uh, the French model produces more different uh, crop types than our data set. So it's important to have a large uh, data set with annotated parcels and uh, different crop types uh, with ma many as possible. So to conclude, the idea of our project is to construct a system of panoptic segmentation of crop fields in Ukraine, which has never been addressed previously, taking into consideration the particularities of the region. Garnou and Landriou showed the panoptic segmentation of crop fields using multi-temporal satellite imagery uh, that is feasible. They tested their approach on French territory. We verified the reproducibility of the pasties uh, data set, created data set prototype for Ukrainian territory and adopted the approach further to Ukrainian territory while trying to improve the baseline uh, performance. 
And our experiments uh, showed that to train a panoptic segmentation model, one needs to have panoptic annotations of high quality, covering as much area of uh, the given country as possible. And uh, such a project may later be advanced with a parcel area calculation, computation of vegetation index, humidity levels of the farms. It may help develop a method to track uh, crops over time and even predict how the particular crop may grow in a specific field. So we believe that such a project may further be used to manage agro, um, agricultural land better and help achieve good agroecological conditions overall. And the uh, last thing uh, we want to stress that uh, while the research community should primarily focus on improving the accuracy of panoptic segmentation for agriculture, it is equally important to explore how to make the model more robust to different input data perturbations and noise. Um, so because while experimenting, we observed that the current state of the method is sensitive to image shift, number of temporal timestamps on, or, or number of parcels in the patch. And uh, this uh, primary, primarily aspects needed to be addressed in the further exploration of this approach, making it robust and production ready. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Taras Firman for supervision, Oku Machine Learning Lab for providing GPU resources and Squad Company for the scholarship. Uh, thank you, and I'm looking for your questions. Thank you, Marianne, and thank you for keeping uh, within uh, time. So maybe start with the discussion, Tras. Will you start, please? Okay. So um, again, the question about uh, like uh, about the task. Um, if um, if you're speaking just about segmentation, so it seems like uh, I don't know if it is like very actual task because of course anyone who needs this information, I hope know what and where is cropped. But uh, most interesting things are in your future works, you have future works because uh, integration with cadaster and uh, something like about humidity and also mentioned yes here uh, are the most interesting and maybe like practical so i try to understand the um, motivation for the for this particular task of segmentation because uh, if i understand right uh, anyone who interested in these formations already know what and where is cropped and the second question is, uh, do you know, um, maybe like one big question. Uh, as I understand, uh, there was some problems with, uh, or troubles with uh, getting the raw data for your um, research. And um, of course, because this information is very closed and so on. But uh, from the, on the other hand, uh, there are many like, um, works done on this kind of data which are not published and uh, closed and uh, as far as i know one company uh, which works with drones for agriculture uav uh, make like the whole cycle so they uh, scan the fields from the drone understand what is with crop in which condition it, and uh, in this full cycle add water or give some signals so this crop is bad and you should like uh, uh, refill or something to do with this so seems like more complex work so how you can compare your task with uh, with these results uh, to the second uh, question uh, yes so it is different like modality we analyze using satellites uh, the images from aerial and satellite are different. And uh, uh, yeah, this is the first case. Uh, indeed, we can compare, if we're talking about comparison with uh, drones and satellite, we can compare with our uh, final like results, uh, like area, uh, vegetation index, humidity levels. Um, yes, this is uh, the first case. Um, to the first question, uh, indeed, uh, the most important things uh, are in future work, but uh, you cannot uh, compute this information without knowing the 
the delineation of the parcel and uh, what uh, grown uh, there. Mm, and also, yes, you mentioned that if the person, a farmer has this information, uh, he knows the information uh, what is grown there, but uh, it is a laborious process to archive this information. And uh, also, I don't know if all farmers do that. So this our model can uh, like give the predicted results and uh, work uh, on the very large area for the whole Ukraine. And uh, this information can be used for the government, for the businesses, and uh, yeah, every, every everyone who wants to work in agriculture. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question about uh, clouds. You mentioned that uh, you sometimes clouds uh, like take forty percent of image, and uh, sometimes you have clouds and shadow of these clouds also, which uh, I think influence uh, the image. So how you deal with this uh, uh, kind of situation? You just remove clouds, and uh, did, do you try to deal with shadows somehow to extract at least some information? Mm -hmm. So uh, indeed, previous to the work that we uh, in, in, were inspired, uh, indeed people were uh, like removing uh, clouds or providing some masks uh, of the clouds and shadows. However, authors of this work uh, mentioned that uh, as we use multi-temporal information, some timestamp can have clouds, some uh, can be uh, no clouds. And um, also, also mentioned that as we use deep learning uh, and it is automated feature extraction, deep learning should learn how to deal with them uh, itself. And it is interesting uh, because as we see, indeed the results are good, but it, at the same time, we still want to compare uh, how we, this model will work if we provide some cloud information like masks and, uh, or yeah, to maybe it will improve the performance. But uh, for now, uh, how we deal with it, the same as the uh, OSIS of the baseline, uh, we, uh, hope that deep learning will uh, learn how to deal with them uh, by using automated feature extraction. Um, Madame, do you use any inform uh, the information about the um, predominant cultures that are grown on that or different parts of Ukraine to train your model. For instance, uh, different cultures are predominant on the south in the southern parts and uh, western parts as you showed us. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for now, uh, as we were only uh, like uh, exploring whether it is feasible to use panoptic uh, segmentation. Uh, we did not adopt any uh, of such information. Uh, however, it is uh, indeed uh, interesting and uh, important. However, in France, for example, how they did uh, in, in the past the data set, I mean, they have their data set from north and south and also uh, yeah, from the east, so different uh, parts of the French uh, territory. And uh, indeed, there, there, there are such uh, cases that the different crops uh, grow in the different uh, region of the earth. Uh, and they do cross-validation uh, to, to verify how uh, training on one patch will uh, generalize to, to another patch. And, uh, for now, uh, they also did not state such a problem. However, I believe uh, we cannot, we can uh, proceed to, to exploring uh, this particular information also in, in this context. Thank you. And another question also maybe uh, related. Um, it, some large territor territories of uh, land uh, are 
owned by large agriculture agriculture uh, companies yes and uh, knowing that information and knowing that uh, in ukraine the tendency is to have la rather large uh, parcels uh, can you actually use this extra information or, or in, in in predicting so different in different areas the owners are different and they have different uh, uh, style or different they grow they are specialized in probably in some particular cultures and then these dictates the the the, the areas they would would uh, actually use mm -hmm. yes indeed uh, this was a problem uh, on which we stumbled upon and uh, for to, to fix it or to leverage this information the first case is to use the proper scale of the uh, satellite images so in france it is it is okay to use 10 meter, meters per pixel but as we see in ukraine it is not okay and uh, the the reason need to find the good uh, resolution of the satellite images to be able to distinguish, uh, to, to have the best model performance. Uh, however, in the like ideal case and the full scale, like in production, I recommend having multiple scales and to uh, have some voting process to verify uh, the parcel delineation and the crop type of the particular region. So have like three models, let's say. Uh, trained on different scale and uh, yeah, see how how uh, average performance would be. And another question: You mentioned that you use temporal data sets. How 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 large uh, time scale is it? Mm -hmm. uh, so we used uh, for each patch. We have uh, satellite images uh, with ten bands. And uh, multi-temporality is the following. Uh, it is from 33 timestamps to 61 uh, throughout the 2017 and 2018 uh, crop yield, crop year, uh, crop yield year. Mm -hmm. And do you use the timestamps in your uh, network? Uh, yes, uh, we have a range uh like for the whole year and we uh, have the uh, date information for each uh, timestamp and we map them um, to uh like to value from zero to 365 and uh, we feed this information to the attention uh, mechanism uh together with uh lowest uh lower res lowest resolution feature map in the uh, feature extraction to collapse uh, temporal information for producing feature maps uh, for the final uh, segmentation module and uh, also do you use uh, actual geo geolocation uh, so the coordinates uh, in your in your network because uh, again well there is a difference of course in, in time in, in growing uh, patterns uh, in different parts of the of the country. So uh, explicitly we uh, did not use. Uh, however, we see see the difference. Uh, while in data normalization process, in the model performance of the model trained on French and evaluated on Ukraine, uh, so I my my uh, thoughts for this question would be the following: so satellite images uh, captured in the specific uh, geographic location, like in Ukraine, have their uh, particular particularities, so-called geographic information embedded into the uh, image. And uh, but explicitly, we don't uh, use uh, uh, coordinates because that that could uh, improve much, have 
much better, much, much influence on, on the result. Okay. Okay. I have a short question uh, regarding, again, this temporal data. So you have uh, satellite images for specific uh, region, uh, specific field, let's say, uh, from different time um, on a year scale. And uh, is there any deviation between the images, like satellite images uh, of the same region? I mean that there are some margins uh, from picture to picture, and if yes, how um, do you deal with those differences? Mm -hmm. So uh, indeed, uh, a satellite has uh, five days of uh, uh, frequency of uh, observing the particular region. Uh, Indeed, some regions, uh, because of trajectory how the satellite uh, flies, some region can have different numbers of um, uh, timestamps available. And how we, we dealt with it, we uh, downloaded a, a little bit more, like we downloaded, say, 100 timestamps. And uh, we sampled, just to be uh, compliant with PASTIS, we sampled from 33 to 61. So actually, uh, for Ukraine, we have 61 uh, timestamp uh, for each patch, uh, uh, like medium, median. Uh, but yeah, this is how we dealt. So we downloaded more timestamps uh, because here satellite uh, have, has a good coverage uh, and the frequency. So we can have the luxury of using uh, more timestamps. But my question was rather uh, when we have difference between the images of the same uh, region. I mean, that what, let's, let's take like uh, two images and uh, say somehow deviate like in, I don't know, 10, 100 meters. So uh, is there uh, um, examples of such deviation within your data? Or you have a precise like images for each region, which uh, overlaps precisely 100 person. There are some uh, parcels that are on the like edge of the trajectory of the satellite that has the deviation like uh, bigger. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, so this is the case. Uh, and how do you deal with this? Are you just like crop on the margins or? try to like find we, the center. Okay, we downloaded uh, one more like good trajectory and uh, crop this particular trajectory. Okay. Cool. Uh, hello, um, Marian, can you actually give maybe more a, uh, again, an understanding question? <laughs> so, the the data that you presented and the results that you presented mainly focuses on like uh, some areas of the land where you have these geometric crops of the land in uh, in different cultures so what i want to understand is or maybe you read it somewhere in the literature is how much for example that spatial information is actually influencing the result so why I'm asking this, because we have like 10 different optical uh, frequency channels, let's say, and which, in my understanding, should be sufficient to well predict uh, different types of labels for like, let's say, for a pixel. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious if you encounter the studies studying this particular question, like, how much information do I need to predict a particular pixel label mm -hmm. and how the spatial information actually enhances this prediction further? Because you show this partly saying that in Ukraine, you have different spatial uh, geometry of the fields and that's very much influences the results. Um, so this sounds more like overfitting of the model. Yes. <laughs> rather than actually uh, some additional information. Uh, so did you do this study, for example, let's, let's abandon at all the, the spatial information. Let's just like take all the data you have 
and create this like uh, data sets where you have like just per pixel classification. And uh, I'm curious if it will differ very much from France to Ukraine, probably not. Uh, and, in, yes. Uh, yes. Maybe you can comment on this. Maybe there are some studies which actually did exactly these experiments. So as I understood, you're talking about just uh, semantic segmentation, uh, pure pixel based. Yes. And uh, indeed, this is the first uh, work that was uh, done in the field. So all, all, all research communities were doing this. And uh, indeed, uh, the, the results are quite similar to France and Ukraine. However, it's not accurate. So it's very rough. I cannot, I, I don't have the, the, the images to show you here, but it will be like very rough shape for this is some uh, soy, soybean, for example. However, in our case, we analyze, uh, we, we, we do instance segmentation, so we delineate, and therefore we have very accurate uh, information of the se se semantic information of the crop type. So it is important to use a very precise, very uh, as uh, good uh, this resolution as possible to obtain the good results to be used. But uh, it's still, you can you can use uh, very like rough information to just estimate like uh, how, how, how much uh, sunflower I have, how much uh, wheat I have, etc. But this is accuracy. Uh, indeed, this uh, particular approach is more accurate. Another question is also from region to region. I think uh, France has slightly different climate and slightly different uh, slightly different crops uh, grown there. So it also would be interesting if you can take like, for example, you, you said that you have uh, temporal information and for example, embed some average uh, temperature, humidity information over the year, let's say on different time scales, and to add this to, to, uh, to your classification model. Indeed, <laughs> first we tried with elevation uh, data uh, for this uh, particular data set, it uh, wasn't uh, like it didn't produce better results. Uh, but uh, indeed, you may experiment with weather, humidity, um, wind, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you so much, Marianne. You can stop uh, sharing your presentation. And we can switch to the final presentation of the first day. So, Alexi, are you with us? Uh, yep. Perfect. So, please start sharing your screen. Uh, I just want to remind you, you have 20 minutes per presentation, so please uh, be precise. And uh -huh. uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, um, so thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, um, good afternoon. And um, well, uh, this, uh, my name is Alexina Irni, and uh, today the presentation will be about the topic reinforcement learning agents in uh, procedural generated environments with sparse rewards. Um, it was done under uh, the supervision of uh, Pablo Maldonado. Uh, so shortly, uh, some outlines. Uh, first, we will uh, present uh, some problem background consisting of uh, sparse rewards and generalization problems. Uh, then we will uh, do some SOTA categorization. We will also indicate what is our proposed approach what is the experiment uh, setup and results? Uh, also indicate some future work to be done, conclusions and answer to review. So let's start from uh, sparse words problem, uh, which is uh, kind of the, the part of the uh, problem that we are trying to solve. As we uh, all, uh, let, let's, let's just recall the basics that, uh, well, this, uh, in reinforcement learning, we deal with uh, the sequential process uh, which, uh, in which we uh, basically interact, in which agent interacts with the environment in a sequence of steps. And at each such step, uh, given the uh, current state, the agent takes an action, gets the reward, and the next state is a feedback. Uh, 
from from this point we can have a can give rise to the notion of return where this uh, return is just the sum of all rewards uh, starting from some particular uh, time step and uh, reinforcement learning basically um, deals with uh, optimization of the expected uh, of the expected return uh, for uh, each state action pair uh, well but uh, there could be some problems here. What is the agent reward is uh, distant, uh, and like the it it brings some uh, some problem with regards to how do we uh, learn, how do we optimize here? Uh, because uh, if agent uh, gets reward only in some distant future, and uh, possibly it can correspond to that uh, the episode terminates only uh, when the agent gets such reward. Uh, it uh, and this reward is like distantly located from the agent. It uh, can um, it can lead to the situation where we have no reward and no learning because the agent can never uh, meet any reward at all, and it means that it never gets any feedback. Uh, the second problem uh, with this is the generalization. Uh, so it's the second problem of which we are dealing with and. Um, it, it relates really related basically to the reinforcement learning um, uh, like equ equivalence between the training and the testing data in a way that uh, the whole bulk of reinforcement learning uh, research was devoted uh, earlier uh, to the training algorithms uh, on and testing it on the data that agent uh, has been trained so there raises the notion of um, of uh, agent generalization capabilities. And uh, procedurally generated environments, uh, they basically, uh, they're basically trying to, they were introduced into the research in order to uh, kind of deal with this um, problem uh, by introducing such configurations as uh, each episode is generated from feature uh, distribution. And also the sequence of levels may be random. It's, um, it's related to this gradual increase of difficulty, which is um, present in, uh, in in many games uh, on which reinforcement learning is trying to uh, train the algorithms and test it. Uh, but in case of uh, in our case, we are dealing with uh, both procedurally generated environments, and also it should have uh, sparse rewards uh, characteristics. And in such a case, uh, the benchmark, uh, which is accepted in the reinforcement learning community, the accepted benchmark is mini grid set of environments. Uh, here we uh, have the situation where the agent, uh, where the agent needs to get to some distant uh, cell, and uh, also that uh, that each environment, each episode is generated basically uh, randomly. The, um, like the, the plus or the advantage of this approach uh, is that uh, if we use uh, this kind of benchmarks in reinforcement learning research, we are more open to different way of experimentations because if we uh, try to use, for example, uh, some kind of uh, some kind of procedurally generated environment with uh, high dimensional uh, states in it. Like, uh, for example, here we see the shooter doom, but we also have procedurally generated environments such as um, uh, such as uh, tower uh, based, and uh, it's it's very hard to basically find uh, find appropriate um, computational resources uh, to do that for uh, for many uh, for many uh, ways. Uh, this was the multi-room environment, and this is the key corridor and abstracted maze. Um, also, uh, two environments from this set of uh, three benchmarks, which are used in the research. Uh, they are also related to uh, multi-room, but in a little bit different way. So here, you need uh, to first find the key, uh, uh, try to open the door, uh, try to move some boxes, and stuff like that. And all these features uh, for each episode are also generated um, randomly. Uh, about the approaches to solve this problem, uh, I think that uh, the most important way to uh, generalize all of them is these are intrinsic motivation approaches. Many of them are trying to induce better exploration in environments by adding the um, uh, intrinsic reward to the sum of uh, rewards in the optimization. 
we can uh, say that there is the assumption, of course, that uh, like after a lear agent learns to reach this intrinsic reward states, uh, these intrinsic rewards, they um, are not that they, they're going to the basically zero and uh, extrinsic rewards start to dominate, uh, basically in order to correspond to our uh, reinforcement learning objective. However, it's not that simple and it's not, uh, it's not forever in all cases that intrinsic rewards converges to zero. So uh, before uh, we stated our goals as the following, first we need to review SOTA approaches because there is a lack in the literature uh, review for uh, for this uh, for solving this particular problem. We we this this problem was um, is is main, it's kind of recent. Uh, it's up to three to four years of uh, solutions uh, research. And the secondary and the most important, we need to create new intrinsic reward formulation with the performance comparable to SOTA. Uh, this is the kind of categorization which we approached, uh, which we approached when we reviewed these approaches. First of all, uh, we have this uh, division between the prediction-based and novelty-based methods. Uh, it's also have its correspondence in the behavioral sciences approaches, uh, but the most important uh, most important distinction here is the prediction based uh, approaches. Uh, they imply creating the model uh, which um, is responsible for predicting some part of the transition dynamics, uh, and hence we generate intrinsic reward based on these predictions. For the novelty based methods, uh, we uh, the, the agent uh, tries to uh, find the uh, the uh, for tries to find the environment the states uh, which are uh, basically states or state action pairs uh, which are basically uh, are novel to him. It can be like counting the uh, previously encountered states, or uh, it can be the difference between the states that uh, uh, that that between the current state, for example, and the next state. Uh, we base our own approach on the two approaches from this set of SOTA. And uh, that's why we indicated uh, here them in red. So uh, we have the no ID, which is basically the combination between the two, and also the right. Uh, the right is, as I said, uh, this is the difference, uh, uh, the distance between the next, uh, uh, the encoding of the next state and the um, encoding of the current state. Uh, there are also some regularization details. We will not go deep into the formulas. We can uh, uh, clarify on them after our um, after this uh, main part of presentation ends. However, inside the novelty based and prediction based, we also have some uh, uh, categorization here. For example, prediction based can uh, be uh, either based on the model that uh, that purely directly predicts, uh, for example, next uh, state. Or it can be based on uh, prediction of the distribution of uh, actor actions uh, for its policy. Uh, for example, in case of adversarial based agents and also on some student teacher uh, policies. Uh, for the novelty based, uh, as I said, for example, agent just counts the actions uh, or, or st state and state action pairs. And uh, this corresponds to the novelty of that particular state if he measure of novelty if he encounters it again. Uh, and environmental centric is there's the difference between the states. Uh, so uh, given all this stuff, we decided to a little bit clarify uh, during the process of writing the diploma our goal. First, we found the gap that no, uh, no uh, SOTA is reporting on the small size maps. Uh, it's a little bit simplified uh, the goal for us because it also raised the question about the uh, proof of concept. So first, uh, logically, our goal is to build such intrinsic reward formulation that we will be able to uh, show at least comparable results to SOTA on small map, on small size maps, and then we will uh, slowly go to the to some of the uh, medium sized maps. About the proposed approach, uh, so uh, this part uh, is uh, basically, as I said, this is responsible for um, you know, for this uh, environmental uh, centric uh, approach. This is uh, novelty based, and it, this is just the distance between encoding of current and the next state. Uh, for uh, this part of the formula, uh, we kind of uh, decided to uh, 
bring uh, to to kind of uh, to kind of uh, negate the disadvantage, the some disadvantage of right, which is the um, um, asymptotic, uh, which is the basic asymptotic inconsistency for the intrinsic reward. As we said before, intrinsic rewards uh, for some of the approaches are not always uh, going to zero. And uh, when we penalize this intrinsic reward more, it means that at least we um, are getting closer to this aim. So this is uh, plays the role of the discount for episodic state. So the reason for this one is that we kind of trying to guarantee that uh, uh, agent uh, does not simply go back and forth inside the episode between uh, next and the current state. And this is our motivation uh, in red, which is basically why we, are, why is this approach? First, we need to track uh, what to to reward those states uh, within those states that change environment the most. And secondary, we want to reward this if they have not been visited earlier in the episode. Uh, this is part is for um, this is a part of my graph from uh, basically diploma. It's uh, Kind of the architecture uh, which we uh, uh, which which we based uh, on on the uh, right the neural network architecture, uh, but we made some uh, changes for uh, for some of the elements of this architecture. First, uh, we should know that uh, this learner uh, it, it has basically uh, my my main parts it has four neural networks. Uh, it has policy network. It has uh, embedding a network which is trying to learn the encoding, uh, which we are using to uh, uh, to uh, for for the intrinsic reward, right? And also, it's uh, used to train the forward net and inverse net. Uh, so it's um, it's kind of uh, similar to the inverse forward inverse dynamics architecture in uh, one of the prediction based approaches like ICM. We'll not go into details. We also can clarify that after the presentation but the main part of it is that we decreased also inside the policy net uh, we decreased the um, you know, first we decreased the amount of um, of, low, of, of layers that, that was there in the LSTM also decreased the um, dimensionality for the neurons there and uh, also we have done some changes to the embedding net uh, architecture in order to uh, to have uh, less dimensions also decrease the architecture there. Uh, so uh, if we want to anyway to uh, shed, if you want to shed light on this architecture later, I can do this, uh, we can do this later. Uh, so small uh, about the experimental setup, um, uh, mainly that we have the, the matrix, uh, our matrix is the role and mean return over the past 10 episodes. Uh, uh, or like this, uh, uh, and, and basically we are trying to uh, track also the, um, the, the, the the amount of uh, frames uh, for uh, for for this uh, for this interaction. So basically, uh, given that uh, we are interacting in pixel-based environments, it uh, is helpful uh, for environments. So uh, small, uh, we are as we said in our goal, we are trying to. Uh, kind of uh, converge uh, faster. I mean, uh, we should improve our sample complexity for first small base, uh, small sized maps. Uh, we uh, extracted these small sized size maps that were not that were never reported in SOTA approaches, uh, and also uh, one medium sized environment in order to confirm the efficiency of our approach. Uh, so, with regards to the uh, small maps. Um, we can uh, see that uh, at least in the uh, case of um, yeah, like four for uh, two of these uh, environments, uh, we see that uh, even for one, it's uh, yeah, convergence is faster. However, our minimal uh, minimal impact here is to uh, uh, is to kind of confirm that at least it is comparable. Uh, whatever the comparable as the term means for. Uh, in, in it's, it's a little it's a little bit ambiguous technically. However, we can say that, for example, in terms of um, frames, um, we are not converging uh, like far far more distant uh, than uh, our SOT approaches. Also, uh, another approach uh, which um, like in, in this uh, in this kind of uh, situation, there was no uh, convergence at all uh, by all uh, algorithms. 
So we can kind of establish that for this small size map, uh, this is all. This is either the problem of um, this that we should just run more um, more uh, samples, more uh, frames in order to check out when it converges. But we have some computational restrictions. Um, or there is just a problem uh, for this particular environment, small size maps for also type approaches and also one right. However, here we can still see that one right, um, it's uh, it's doing better in, uh, in visually speaking, uh, comparing to uh, to uh, right and no ID with which we are comparing uh, our own approach. Uh, also, uh, we confirmed the efficiency of it uh, with uh, the medium sized map. Mm, the thing is that uh, here at least um, we were able to uh, uh, to kind of uh, uh, reproduce the result for uh, the paper from right. For example, in, in right, we see the convergence. Um, uh, uh, we see the, the convergence exactly on uh, on like some somewhere around five five million of frames. But uh, in uh, like and we can we can see this that it it happens uh, for no ID it's uh, kind of tricky they have not posted any reports uh, for this medium sized environment uh, probably there is still some um, hyperparameter optimization uh, is needed there because they used just their fixed uh, architecture um, but here we also can see that uh, one right at least uh, is working comparable to uh, to other. Uh, uh, to other two approaches from which we derive our own. Uh, this is the plot, which is uh, about uh, convergence, uh, intrinsic about convergence. Uh, as I said, there is a problem of convergence for uh, right. Uh, and uh, we, uh, by uh, making our um, criterion more strict, we see that the distribution of intrinsic reward, uh, the medium and uh, the distribution is generally smaller than for right. And we are, uh, we, are, we are not that affected by that problem here, at least. Uh, for some future work, uh, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I kind of uh, posted here, there are uh, two, uh, two main uh, points. The first one is we tried also adversarial one right, which is basically we are trying to, uh, to build like another adversarial classifier is trying to predict whether uh, the state in which uh, which uh, which agent uh, will, uh, will will go after his action, the, whether this state was already uh, visited, and uh, this allows yeah, this allows uh, uh, in, in, at least in my hypothesis was that it will allow to kind of. Uh, uh, Make this criterion even even more strict for the uh, visitors, uh, for the visited states, and also for some states which were already visited. Uh, it's not necessarily that they are not they are not important for exploration in the future, and probably if uh, agents uh, can't really guess that this state was adversarial agent was visited, it means that there is some unpredictability there. Uh, another thing is Dina Q plus bonus, it's uh, basically the, uh, the idea is that we, um, uh, it, it's the idea of the Saturn. Uh, this is his uh, work and uh, his bonus. Uh, however, uh, the idea is not just to introduce this bonus, okay, but to try to track uh, that the bonus is basically based on the uh, amount of uh, times, uh, of time steps uh, passed uh, from when this uh, state uh, action pair was uh, was visited, it means that if the some action state pair has been visited long time ago, it probably means that it uh, deserved to be visited again. Uh, in our case, uh, this tracking of time steps can uh, we can introduce it in order to uh, uh, kind of uh, re reset our counter for our states using some time threshold theoretically. Uh, as for the serial classifier, this um, uh, this plot means that uh, for a small sized environment, I have seen some improvements uh, comparing to one right. Uh, however, um, I'm not plotting it here. However, in the medium sized environment, there was uh, no convergence at all. So I decided to uh, make it in the future work section. As a conclusion, we can say that reviewed sparse reward PGA approaches, we proposed a new intrinsic reward formulation one right, uh, 
Uh, in experiments, we showed that we have SOPA comparable results in small, medium sized PGA used in research, and also that we propose possible improvements for future work. As a reply to review, uh, yes, there, there is first, there is a GitHub remark. Uh, I, I used the wrong version of the code when I was uh, doing this uh, open sourcing. And, um, but this, this recalls more systematic problem of um, like code uh, reproduction from uh, all of these uh, methods. Uh, basically, uh, the problem is that we need manual uh, tweaking in order to uh, run these method, uh, methods all at once and like compare them uh, immediately. Uh, but this is not, it should not, should be avoided and some, uh, uh, some uh, refactoring needs to be done in order to allow user to execute all at once. For the future work remark, I agree that like too much concentration on slight improvement in model efficiency is not a good choice. However, I just wanted to post this, that uh, it can be just a milestone to get a much bigger improvement. Yeah. Also, I fully agree with uh, with the, uh, the the idea that we need to uh, go more fundamental on uh, on this um, on, on, on this on this problem. Uh, so, uh, thank you uh, for your attention. And if uh, uh, you, you you want, you can uh, pose any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alexey, for your presentation. And uh, let us start discussion. Who wants to start? Us. Um, okay, so there is an interesting uh, research, uh, and first I would like to ask, uh, have you tried to publish your results or submit to some conference? Oh, uh, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, so actually, uh, I, I have not tried this, uh, but um, I'm, I'm like, I, I, just, I, I do want this uh, uh, because uh, there is this, um, as, 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 as we have seen in this presentation, probably um, there is a big trend for this uh, on a lot of conferences, uh, including ICML, uh, NeurIPS, uh, for this particular uh, set of environments. Uh, but yes, I, I, I wanted it, but uh, no, I have not, <laughs> have not mm -hmm. submitted. Okay, why well, I'm asking because uh, like uh, more reviews uh, could better uh, get us possibility to estimate um, the enhancements of your results. Mm -hmm. uh, in this way, my next question is, uh, it seems like uh, you did some specialized um, enhancement only for some pre-selected tasks. And uh, comparing to other sort of results, uh, it could not give uh, such a good results uh, for, for other tasks. Have you tried, and as extension of these questions, maybe you have tried for different uh, like tasks and can show some results, not just uh, mentioned in your presentation, but maybe for more wider range of tasks. Um... Thank you for the question. Unfortunately, um, have not tried this um, I, uh, because of uh, you know the time constraints and some computational constraints. However, yes, I fully agree. I fully agree that uh, uh, this should be done. I mean, uh, even considering the papers uh, that um, basically describe this sort of approaches. So what they have been doing is that they, yes, they are concentrated on this set of environments. But they then, um, they wanted also to, not in all cases, I mean, some papers were only for this set of environments, but at some cases, people uh, wanted to uh, confirm that this will work for high dimensional environments, like for example, uh, uh, like, like for example, Doom, or uh, like for example, uh, uh, Montezuma Revenge, uh, and, uh, similar, uh, and so it's like more more high dimensional task. It's not procedurally generated environment, but it has the um, in, in some ways it has the characteristics of sparse rewards, and uh, this is the, the the way for them to check. Uh, probably the problem right now for research is the um, why why it's not this systematic is that uh, and why I was not. Um, uh, I mean, I, 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 I was, I, I didn't regard it as like the, uh, the obligatory part uh, of uh, my experiments is that basically there are no, 
there are a, lot, a, a little of uh, procedurally generated environments with sparse rewards and high dimensional uh, with high dimensional states. So um, that, that, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Just as a remark, uh, I don't, I'm curious why your supervisor did not push you to submit it to some conference, not requiring your answer. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, so it's, um, first of all, I, I think that uh, more, more tests should be done. And uh, like then after this medium sized environments, I should go to, uh, probably the large ones. And then after the large ones, I should try this Montezuma Revenge uh, or, or some other uh, environments that are used as a practice uh, of confirming the results in such papers. Uh, and that's why probably I, it's not, I'm not sure that's about supervisor, frankly speaking. I think it's more about my own, uh, uh, like in confidence that for some top conferences, uh, I need more, more work for, for, for this work to be accepted there. Okay. Uh, I have a question about this environments. Uh, do you know the algorithm, how they generate, are generated? I mean, uh, uh, this is uh, some external tool used to generate, uh, um, to generate this environment. Yeah, with uh, doors and uh, keys and so on. So, yes, uh, uh, yes. Uh, do you know what algorithms they use? I mean, uh, uh, to ensure that uh, this, uh, uh, for example, you can, when you generate mazes, you can uh, generate perfect maze, not perfect maze, uh, mazes with loops or without loops. Uh, you, you must ensure that from every point to every point, you have at least one path and so on. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's not, uh, as, as, for, as for my, um expertise uh, i'm not fully sure i mean uh, this is mini grid they have the gym mini grid code in the github um, so from what i have seen there um, uh, there is no uh, they are not using some uh, i guess specific algorithm uh, this is not like uh, uh, for example uh, there was the tower challenge so in tower they uh, used uh, this is the Unity Unity challenge. Uh, they use some specific algorithm for, for this one. They use just a sampling from multivariate distribution of these features having some constraints. Like for example, uh, as you as you correctly mentioned, so for example, the um, in, in, in this GIF uh, you can see the, the, the there is still a gap between the rooms. Like you can you can still go to from one room to another. So you are not. Uh, Set up there. So, for example, number of rooms is generated. Uh, number um, in some cases, uh, if uh, you provide as in, in, in my case, this was this small map. Uh, we can constrain ourselves to small maps, uh, which has a smaller size. Uh, we can constrain ourselves to number of rooms, or we can do uh, generate them uh, randomly. We can constrain ourselves to the whole uh, configuration of this maze, right? So, uh, like where in the in our space, XY space, uh, the rooms should be located, for example. Uh, okay. and, and, and for example, the green cell, right? So we need to somehow uh, configure the green cell location. So, and something like that. But as from what I have seen in GitHub, it seems like this is just uh, random uh, sampling with the constraints. Okay, but uh, when you have uh, such a problem, uh, Imagine that you know everything about the position of the target and, and you need to optimally go to this. You can use the like uh, standard value iteration algorithm. Uh, yeah, 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 so I fully agree, fully agree, yes. It would be good to compare your uh, neural net, uh, uh, learn neural nets with this uh, classical approach uh, uh, in terms of optimal optimality. Yeah, sorry, sorry, my fault. I have not mentioned that this is, uh, it, it has the partial observability characteristics. And you can see, uh, I'm not sure that it's represented in the video uh, I'm showing, but you can see that we have, the agent have the constraints, um, like constraint square set, uh, where he gets the, uh, the, 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 the information about the state of the environment. So they consider, they, they kind of restricted themselves to partial, uh, I mean researchers, restricted themselves to partial observable uh, environment. 
But you're fully right that uh, we need to compare the, this is logical, compare the efficiency of uh, like working it in partial environment to, uh, to, to, to full observable environment and then compare them to more uh, like dynamic programming as I understand you, you say that. Yeah. I understand, understand correctly that actually here he can see through the walls uh, all this uh, uh, light, uh, light rectangle, it's uh, the visible range of the agent, yes? Yes, yes, yes. He can see through the walls. Uh, in, in a way, yes, yes. Okay. Maybe one more question about uh, this uh, specific um, demo. Uh, have you tried to add cycles to the uh, road uh, to try if if the agent will be able to avoid cycles? Uh, have you really direct ways, but uh, have you tried with cycles on the way? Uh, um, I'm, I'm not uh, sorry. I'm not sure uh, what you mean by uh, cycles in this particular. Uh, cycles on the road. I mean, uh, here we see only direct ways to the target. Yes. No, yes. no deviations. No. Okay. Loops. Yes. Yeah, so. Ah, I, I see. Loops yeah. On the way. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Uh, unfortunately, I have not tried this one. Yeah, but I understand. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I have a small question regarding your uh, selection of the small world problem. Uh, so basically, what was the motivation? Because you mentioned that you find the gap, that there was not that many results for small world, but probably uh, alternative answer for this uh, gap would be that small worlds are not that interesting for the community. And for that reason, they just skip it. Uh, the thing is that, um, like, we can uh, so we can answer this one like that. But uh, first, it's a little bit subjective. Uh, and uh, secondary, uh, um, let's recall that here in this particular um, case, we are dealing with like also the generalization problem, right? So it means that uh, if we like, it's also probably the subjective description of this, but. Uh, I also in included this in the discussion uh, that probably if we are very sure that our agent uh, is good uh, generalizing to medium or large size environments, it means that uh, it should be able to also generalize to small maps. This was my uh, like the assumption of uh, of kind, and also uh, the second fault of this vision is. From small maps, at least we can uh, proceed given the computational constraints, uh, having some computational constraints, at least to proceed uh, with different ideas and iterate more quickly. And this is, it's not related to um, the, the choice of the benchmarks, but it's related to the mechanics of, of, of this um, uh, approach. Okay, thank you. This is just a general question. So, can you uh, can you estimate how, for example, this kind of agent will perform across um, many tasks? Because currently you had like three benchmarks, three environments, but for example, like uh, the DeepMind uh, Agent Fifty Seven was like particularly benchmarked over like many different bench uh, environments, showcasing superior performance on uh, on average, on larger amount of environments. So can you predict, I know that it's a hard experiment to run, but can you predict, for example, how this kind of agent would perform across large uh, set of different environments? Or you need very specific kind of environments? Um, well, it's, uh, I guess that um... <clears throat> First, we will, uh, as I recall correctly, uh, I'm not sure that Agent 57 uh, has been trying the Montezuma range, for example. It, but it was. Uh, or it was in Never Give Up. But still, I guess that Agent 57 is based on Never Give Up. And I guess in Never Give Up, they were benchmarking against the Montezuma. And in the Agent 57, they used all this. Um, um, 
all these Atari based environments um, simultaneously trying to find the, the, the better exploration policy for them. But uh, well, I think that the connective link between this is really trying out the Montezuma. Uh, so if we were, if we are able to converge uh, with this approach in at least one environment, uh, Montezuma, uh, then we will be able to at least uh, to at least you know project this on the performance of Agent Fifty Seven uh, because. Uh, if we, uh, I'm not sure, uh, it's, it's not always correlated, of course, uh, but still, uh, if, uh, uh, like, it, it was, as I understand, the, it was uh, fully based on this, uh, like, trying to adapt, uh, find this exploration policy, uh, the best exploration policy, uh, in a way, then if we are showing the comparable results, uh, then probably, yes, but still, um, Agent 57, as I understand, it contains not only sparse reward environments, it contains uh, a lot of dense reward environments. Uh, so it's, it's very hard uh, before, you, uh, before you try, I guess. But thank you for the question. This is, this is a great question. <laughs> What what was actually the, uh, the like the downside? Why haven't you tried actually Montezuma Revenge in your side? Because it's kind of a relatively simple Atari environment to try on. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, I just um, I just didn't have enough time. This is uh, just didn't have enough time to you know configure all uh, all computational um, all, all computational resources for that one, but. Uh, this is this um, this this also is one of the limitation of this work. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Oxy, thank you so much uh, for answering uh, the question, the questions, and for the presentation. Thank you. So right now we stop the presentations. Uh, and uh, basically that's it.